introduce you to Bianca. So, um, yes, Bianca Gottfriedson. Uh, Bianca, please wave hello to everybody so that everyone can see who you are. And uh, Bianca is the inventor of Xena Box, and he is our CEO of the business as well. And uh, he's going to be taking you through this onboarding workshop. Um, what I will be doing is that I will be uh, doing administration, et cetera, in the background. Um, and uh, what we may find is that if you would like to have a special session set up, then I will certainly do that. I will follow up with you and we can set up a, a separate session. So, Bianca, I think what I'm going to do is let me hand over to you so that everybody who has <coughs> been before can get used to your Danish accent. Yes, thank you very much, Judy. Um, so uh, what we try to do here in the next uh, one and a half hour is um, kind of like get everybody a bit familiar with uh, with our uh, CubeSat kit. And um, what we want you to um, kind of like use this opportunity to is that um, uh, ask question if you tried something, if you the stuff you can't get to work and things like that, then this is kind of like what we want to do. So uh, Julie and I have divided the job between us like this. I'm going to take you through the technical things, uh, technical questions you might have, uh, software, hardware, that kind of stuff. If you have admin issues, like you're missing a thingy, then uh, ask Judy. Um, and, and um, you know, understand that, um, um, you know, obviously because of the the situation we are here with the pandemic here, I think that uh, some of the stuff just taking a bit longer time to arrive than others. Um, but some of you guys have had it for, for, for quite a while. So we thought um, this is a good uh, opportunity to do a, a bit of onboarding here. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of like talk about the kits. And, and of course there's videos, there's a, a, a page how to, um, uh, to set it up, the, you know, a, a web page, how to set it up and, and work with it and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, we just, I just want to talk like not too long about this thing here because I hope that we, we very quickly come into some questions. And then, you know, by answering some of those questions, I hope that I'm helping uh, other people that might have the same questions. Um, I think if you have questions, um, uh, do me a favor and just put them into the chat. Judy will look at the chat. She might uh, either read up the question and or say to me, oh, Bjarke, please read that question yourself here. And then I will uh, try to um, uh, to answer it as, as best as I can. So um, let's let's start with, with, with the kit here. So um, what you've got, and, and I has assembled it a bit just so you can see how it is assembled because uh, you got it not assembled. So that was straightforward. So the easy part here is a, a ground station. So the ground station is a, a radio that communicates to uh, your satellites. And then another radio, this is the Wi-Fi module. So that you connect to your Wi-Fi either wherever you are. Hopefully um, uh, you are not logged in at home, but if you are, you connect it to your home Wi-Fi, which by the way is probably the easiest one to connect to. Then there's a little display here and then there is the IPO one, which serves as a programmer. It can load the software into the to the Wi-Fi, which is also the core. So this is the uh, the module that actually communicates with your um, that actually runs the whole setup here. So the, the MCU, as we call it, the microcontroller unit, is this uh, one here, and it also has the Wi-Fi. And this one here uh, converts the USB into a serial connection so it can talk to that and it connects uh, via any of these four connectors. You can put it together like you want to, but obviously uh, the radio and the Wi-Fi doesn't have any connector at the top. So therefore I put it on the top and the display doesn't have any connector here on the, what I call the west side. Uh, so we call, we use the north side, south side, east and west. And when lie this, this is the top and this is the bottom. So therefore, when I refer to this top here, this is not the top, this is the north. Just so when you look at this as uh, six ways, you can understand what I'm talking about. So there's no connector on the, on the west side here, and therefore I have it that side. So that kind of like defines uh, how I put this together. 
you can put it together in a you know in a T or you can put it together like in a long strip. The reason why it's a good idea to put it together like this is if one of the connectors is a little loose or um, you know you have connected disconnected many times so they start not being as good as, as they are, then each of these X tips have two communication ways. So any one of these connectors can be taken out and it will still work. That's going to be interesting when you build your satellite having that redundancy. But when I put a circuit together like this, I always put it together this slightly more difficult way because then I'm also more sure that it works. Um, so this is, um, and I have an ILO2 here. You can use ILO2 or ILO3. It doesn't really matter for, uh, for, for, for your project here. Uh, so for me, I just have an ILO2. And the rest, uh, you might have an ILO3. Maybe you have a two. The rest is actually uh, straight forward. So I'm going to stop here and uh, to see if there's any question. Do you have any 3D printer files for housing the ground station? And yes, I have. Actually, I have a system so you can design your own ground station. And that is pretty cool. So I'm going to demonstrate that, Judy. Don't you think that's a good idea? So I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, I've, uh, I've added the link box.x and a box.cc to, yes. to the channel. And then that's also, good. Thank you. Um, it was another question from Aidan Peck. Let so me just show this first, Judy, then I'll come back good. to you. So this is box.x and a box.cc. And this is a little tool where you can design your own uh, box for the ground station. Up here, you tell how many X tips you have in a one and other direction. So for example, if you say, I have three here and update, I can see then you have, um, um, just let it run a little. So my machine is a little slow. So some of the stuff I'm gonna do like this thing here is just slow simply because I have a laptop and the Zoom, I don't know, it just decides to uh, not be the fastest here. But here you can see now there's, um, uh, uh, three X tips in one direction, two in the other. Your ground station is, of course, two by two. And number, so I'm just going to update that. And then these numbers refer to these numbers here. You can actually change the numbers if you have multiple things you want to do. You have to measure the height and things like that, but you can, you know, use a tool like this thing here or just a ruler to kind of like figure out what the height is on, on your circuit. There's a little space between this um, standoff and the wall. That's this space here. The wall is two millimeter thick wall. You can uh, set that up. The uh, standoff is a height of the standoff here. There's a standard text. You can say how you want to print it, like the box or the lid, or that lid upside down. Uh, so it's more uh, uh, printer friendly. You can have rounded corners. Now let's just quickly show this. If you say, I have a USB power, then it will do a little hole here. On a number two, that's, uh, sorry, number one is not USB power, number one is the OLED. So we say display OLED. Number two is the CW1, so that's just the LED in the middle. And number three is the IPO1, so that's a display USB, uh, power USB. And then number four, that's a radio. So I go and say radio somewhere here. And then I can even, um, um, and then on number one here, I also have like an LED, so I can go in and I'm just doing that to show you how it works. Oops. One, and I can say LED here again. And if I say update, then it designs uh, this circuit here. And you can see there's the hole for the radio. So I'm holding up the kit here. There's a the display. There's the USB. And if I say generate STL, then it does that. And then I can download the STL. And uh, I can show that in my finder here. And uh, then I have to just uh, in my sharing, stop sharing that. Um, sorry, stop share. And then I have to share my other screen, which is, must be the preview here. So you can see here is uh, the box. So this is the STL file. You can print it yourself. Or you can send it to printing uh, um, as you feel like. So that's uh, that's this uh, kit here. Next question: How do you correct the SNO1 no fix reading? 
Yeah. <clears throat> um, so the SNO one. So that's the that's the um, TPS uh, module here. So this TPS, when we made that, we tried to make it um, as low cost as possible here. So there's no battery backup on that, and a little primer in uh, in TPS and 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 navigation uh, in general is that um, a DPS chip like this thing here have to download what's called an almanac. So an almanac is kind of like, a, um, uh, it, it's an old seafair word, but it's kind of like a calendar of where the different satellites are at different times. So it have to download that. Um, and if it, and what we have done is that in our software, we have, but you can download that, that almanac over the, from the GPS. It just takes a very long time because you have to have a really good signal to, to download. And it's kind of like a lot of data. And when I say a lot of data, it's of course not a lot compared to anything else, but for GPS, it's a lot of data. The way that our kit works is that uh, the, the radio on the flight station communicates, well, the, the flight station using the radio on the flight station communicates to the ground station and ask for the almanac and the Wi-Fi module then downloads it from Ublox. There's a, a Ublox uh, uh, GPS that sits uh, on it. It downloads the almanac from Ublox and uploads it over the radio up to you. And then you should be able to get a fix quicker. But here's the thing. It only runs on GPS. A lot of other satellite system also runs on GLONASS and on uh, Baidu and uh, Galileo, all the other different systems that exist. This one here only runs on um, uh, only runs on a, uh, on a DPS system, and what that means is that you, when you get your initial fix, you have to have a clear sky. It will not work inside, and I know it's freezing cold where you are. We have it a little bit better here in the south, so you know uh, I know there's a couple of guys from Hawaii, so you survive uh, pretty well too. But you actually have to take it outside, and you have to have a kind of like. Um, and not a clear sky, but you have to have a clear view, so nothing that um, that blocks you. As you work with this thing here, you can try to kind of like just have it hanging out the window, or you can kind of like try to figure out how much it is that you need of a clear sky. Some might just, you know, be lucky that, uh, and there's some apps you can download on your phone where you can figure out where's the different GPS uh, satellites. So if you, for example, want to look out the window, I have a window here in front of me. If I want to go look out the window, I will take my deep, this app on my phone, see where the, where the satellite is. If there's only one or two in that direction, I know that I probably have to hang out the window. I actually put it outside. So getting a fix is a matter of clear sky. If you don't have a fix after, and it can take some time, depending on if you've got the radio set up properly and all that kind of stuff. So if you haven't got a fix uh, after 15 minutes, then you're probably not going to get a fix. But just sometimes it can take long time. Sometimes it just take 20 seconds. So um, um, that is uh, that. Um, Judy, that's you it, that's it for now, Bjorka. I think. That's uh, cool. That's cool. What, I will then. Yeah, and what, uh, what yes. I did is that I uploaded the link to your 30 minute video on how to use X in a box. That's so, great. Thank uh, you very much. The, the Thank the you, Judy. Boxing box design tool. Fabulous. Thank you. Back to uh, you, Bjorka. Thank you. Then Jeff is just asking generally, what is the range under ideal condition? So uh, range is, um, there's a lot of radios here. There's a GPS radio, you know, a receiver. There's our two radios, ILO1, ILO2, ILO3, whatever you have. And of course the Wi-Fi. <laughs> so when we talk about range, uh, it's, it can be all that. So Jeff, I assume the range you're talking about is a range between the ground station and the flight station. We have ourselves flown these two with 200 miles uh, range. Uh, so that uh, so if you have and this is with these kind of antennas that sit on here. So one of the things that the reason why we use these radios, these radios are lower radio, and lower radio is a technology. Lower is long range or uh, you know low power, whatever you want to use the LO for. But but the reason why uh, LoRa, we use LoRa is because the link budget is exceptional. And that link budget is how much you transmit with. And then, you know, you have gain an antenna, you, you, use, you lose some 
as you have distance, you can have a little bit of loss in the cables between antenna and radio. We don't have any cable between radio and antenna here, so very little. And then it's how well the receiver receive. Now, the radio transmits with 20 dB, but the receiver have a sensitivity. It listens with minus 148 dB. So you have a link, link budget 168 dB between the radios. And that's the reason why it works really, really um, good and long range. And it's still long, low power. So of course, um, if it's both on the ground, you're not getting the same uh, distance because uh, you have what's um, a fresnel zone of, 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 of stuff that's uh, in the way. But if you fly this on a balloon, and this is how we got our 200 miles uh, range, we flew it on a balloon and the balloon went to um, 33,000 feet. And, uh, and we were standing uh, eventually over the coast because it disappeared over the coast. Uh, and we could then get the data as it um, flew towards Australia. Um, um, and, and that was three degrees over horizon. So, so we knew that uh, we were not getting much more. If we were much higher up with the ground station, so from a theoretical point of view, if we are flying both of these on a balloon, uh, and they are both 15,000 feet up, so like five kilometers. They should be able to talk between each other a thousand kilometers, 700 miles or whatever it is. So that's the range. Cool. So let me um, get back to uh, the kit. And as I said, like whenever you have questions, things like that, just fire them off here. Uh, Judy will pick them up from, uh, from time to time. So our kit, so uh, so the ground station uh, assembled here. So that was uh, what I started with here. So the radio to uh, receive from your satellites and uh, and of course the uh, Wi-Fi that uploads the data, a little display so you can see what's happening. And this is power and it also allows you to upload the software from our X in a box upload, our software that uploads it to this uh, fellow here. And of course, uh, you normally, if you work with satellites before, the ground station is, you know, like something big with a big antenna sticking out the, uh, you know, signal roof, a Yaki antenna have to be pointed in a special direction, things like that. And and all that is still great. Um, but the reason why we of course don't have it is because um, we can't really ask uh, students to to set up a ground station with like, a, you know, a big rig like that. But in the old days, when you did satellites, you used amateur radio band um, and the radio amateur band, there was only one frequency you could, you normally had allocated. When we use this thing here, it's a spread spectrum, spread spectrum radio. What it means, it jumps between the different channels. So, so it will kind of like figure out which channel there's least noise on. Now, on your radios in the US, or the frequency in the US, where most of you are, so the Americas, North and South America, your frequency that you use on the 915 and on, you can also do it on the ILO 2, so ILO 3, ILO 2, is non 915 megahertz. If uh, you're in Europe, it's 868 megahertz. We do have another radio, which is the ILO 1. And the ILO 1, I have it here, similar size here, that frequency is 434 megahertz. And for if there's any radio amateur in between here, that is the same frequency of the seven centimeter band. So uh, if you're a radio amateur in the Americas, you can use that. But in Europe, you don't have to have a radio amateur license because this falls in within the ISM band, similar to what the 915 and 868 is. So this one here gives a slightly longer range, a little bit less data speed. Um, but for, for the experiments you probably want to do, the communicating between them, um, uh, this is a, a slight overkill. And at least this thing here doesn't require radio license. The ILA one in America has require you have an amateur radio license. Okay, so that is the ground station. Um, if you have a, a, a of course, a, a couple of things more on a LoRa, um, we have written our own like lower to lower communication. So we use the same radio, they communicate uh, the same way between the two. If you have a lower radio in, in like a big ground station rig, there's nothing that stops you from from using that. I never tried it, so uh, I, I would know um, 
where to start. Of course, there's the standard LoRa parameters like uh, spreading factor and things like that. You have to dial in, um, but but I'm sure you can you can do that. And by the way, the radios are two-way radios. They're talking to each other. In, in Italy, the only they, so, so the way we've done the software is that just talk to each other in Italy to kind of like make sure everything is fine and working and all that. Once they're flying, the communication is more or less one way because we don't want to be in a situation where this stop uh, where this stops sending data because this one here doesn't answer. So um, so that's kind of like how the the code is. But if you want to, you know, make your own code, modify your own code, they're two way, and the little radio here have a, like a little uh, antenna switch. And I'm saying that for some of you guys that maybe have done radios on on satellites before. There's a built-in antenna switch here, so the RX and TX uh, is not kind of like overloading each other. There's two different pins on the Semtech chip here. And when it comes out, it kind of like automatic switch to use the antenna for RX and TX. So they're simplex radios. They either receive or they transmit. They can't do both. Um, so next step is the flight station. So the flight station, I kind of like it put it together like this way here. And I'm going to change that slightly um when i get into the detail but i just put it in like this now just to save a little bit of time so i have a number of x chips here and the uh, the stuff that makes it a cube set is actually this connector we have here so this is this pc 104 connector and it's called 104 because there's 104 pins here and we use like four of them so we don't use a lot um but that's because in the old days, uh, you didn't have a bus to communicate between your different devices. So each device was spending like a number of pins. And this PC-104 standard, I think the current version is from 2005 or something you know, like 15 year old standard, but it was developed back in the 70s or 80s. And when the CubeSat was invented and, and uh, you know, they wanted to figure out what can they fit inside a CubeSat, Back then, that was ridiculously small in the end of the uh, 1999 or something like that, I think it was invented. They figured out the PC-104 board, which is approximately this size, you know, 10 by 10 centimeter, will fit in perfectly. So this was technology that already existed. So this one here, this PC-104 that you're getting, you're getting two of them. You can connect them, stack them together in your kits, and then, of course, they will communicate over that PC-104. It's a bit overkill, but if you have other PC-104, other CubeSat stuff, let's say you have a battery module already, or you maybe want to use another radio you have. So if you university school institution have other CubeSat kit you want to play with, then <coughs> you can interface with that. Now, obviously, um, if it's just power, like you have a rechargeable battery or solar panel and things like that, then it doesn't really matter because uh, you just take that one out and, you know, it creates uh, power to the circuit. But if you have another radio and want to use it, or like, for example, we have this, uh, um, this other module here, which is a uh, uh, Raspberry Pi Zero that you could uh, connect. Um, so, for example, if you want to run NASA's software, NASA have some software that call uh, CFS, um, which is like a, a satellite uh, um, uh, satellite control software uh, that runs on a Raspberry Pi. So um, you can get the Raspberry Pi anywhere, but we have like this little bridge called a BIO3 that allows you to do that. It's not in your kit, but if you wanted to do it, you could um, interface that. So you can also, let's say you have your own flight computer, but you want to use the sensors. All the sensors we use, including the radio, runs I2C, so therefore you can communicate that uh, using this thing here. So let me get into a little bit more detail on this. We call it the BSO one So we call it a bridge. So uh, this is a BR1, so bridge Raspberry Pi. This is a bridge single board computer, so our single board computer interface for, for the PC of, uh, PC of, um, uh, PC104. On the back here, you can see in the bottom, so I'm trying to make sure, let me just check here if uh, my focus is right here. There's two solder points. The two bottom ones are soldered, and the two top one is not soldered. And that's because um, despite a lack of, uh, of standard um, 
on, on using how these piece, uh, these pins here, um, a number of different organizations are kind of like decided, we have something we call I2C payload and I2C systems. And uh, so that's specific pins here. There is a documentation on this uh, page, Judy, if you want to put the link in to the XK7 page, just so we sure everybody have it. So this xnabox.cc slash pages slash um, XK7. There's a link to the documentation around how this is kind of like configured if you want to. You mean XK, you mean XK90, Bjorka? No, I mean XK7. Okay. Uh, it must be, sorry, is it not an XK7? Maybe it's an XK90. No, sorry, just I'll check find it. First. it. I'll find it. Cool. That's fine. Okay. So, so it's default solder to what's called uh, I2C payload. And of course, the other one uh, that you get is also PC one of, uh, it's also uh, I2C payload. So therefore, they communicate with the I2C on the bus here to the one that's called I2C payload here. And there's two specific pins, um, and that's in the documentation that Judy puts in. If you can't find it, I will uh, put in a link later on. Um, so that's the one thing. We also have on our main bus communication using uh, SEO, uh, UART, uh, RXTX, that kind of stuff. But we don't use it in any of our kit here, but, but we might use it on later states. For that reason, there is also a um, solder point on the top for deciding uh, if you want to communicate uh, using UART, they're not soldered. So um, that's, uh, um, that's, that's not there. Then we also have a five volt uh, solder point here. We haven't soldered. And what that allows to do is that there's five volt on this bus here. So if we, for example, feed five volt, because you can use the PC104, sorry, you can use the IP01, to feed power to this thing here. And there's of course five volt on this. There's also 3.3 volts. If you want the five volt to come out in here, you have to solder that point up there. That's called five volts. It's not soldered because we uh, suggest not to use, uh, not necessarily use it on this, you know, what you're doing as it is with a lot of this. In any case, that is how that is. So in, in a kit, a complete kit is having uh, other, um, uh, six X chips, or you know, this, uh, the similar size, so six X chips, or uh, they have, let me just put my other kit together here, or they have four. So they all have four and sitting on these connectors, every second connector here, so the middle ones, or they are like this way here, so they sit on the, the middle and the two outer ones here. Now, this thing here is PC 104 standard uh, when it comes to size and everything. This thing here is 96 millimeter from top to bottom. So it still fits within your cube set, but it hangs over in what's called the overhang area. So normally you're not allowed to have PCB in that area, but you're allowed to have antenna and connectors and things like that. But we try to say, well, you can choose to be compliant or you can use the overhang area. So the same connector, you just click it in the one or the other way, depending on you know how much space you uh, uh, you you want to use. So I just put in our kit into two like this in here. So the one I use six X step spaces, and all is four. And then we have this last one here. It's not like strictly necessary, but we have the holes here that matches the standard PC one hundred four, and then you get like a, a, a thing like that. Some of them are not having um, the mask on the knees. We kind of like when we got them last time, they, they didn't put the mask on the knees here. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, what you do is that <clears throat> these ones is to actually, if you really want to try to fly this thing here, you can then actually screw this in. So you can see there is the standard holes in the corner here that will hold the whole thing together. And then all these holes that sits here they fit the holes that you have on some of the X tips around here. Uh, in that document that uh, is for the um, for for the BS01, there is also um, a document that there's also like description of uh, the screws, the screw sizes, the nuts, the bolts, the spacers, the distance between, and all that kind of stuff. And there are links to um, uh, to uh, I think a DDK or Mouser on, on where you can find uh, those uh, 
uh, nuts and bolts if you want to use that. Okay. Um, so what I want to do now is that I'm just going to take this apart here because um, if I take this uh, bar out here and I take the one out on the other side like that and then I have uh, this one here I'm also taking that away I have a blank here the emptier one you probably don't have it uh, it doesn't really matter for what I'm doing now but if I'm kind of like putting together my kit like this thing here and then um, this is uh, the one thing I had then uh, I'm getting another format um, uh, in my kit here so let me put it together like that um, a second here we go so this is the, the the tips you got for the flight station now my si01 here is black this is actually we flew we flew we flew seven of these on the on a satellite mission seven satellites on on saturday on the sinset mission where uh, we have a satellite that looks uh, like this thing here it's not ours it's uh, the sinset program out of virginia so there we have the different x chips and uh, we, so we have some black x chips there's nothing special about them um, so this is si1 it works as fine as the white one. I just didn't have one here for in preparation for today. So um, um, uh, so it just looks black here. It doesn't have a connector here at the top because of uh, of, of the thin set here. Anyhow, this is uh, the kit and this is the, the flight station. If you don't use these, these ones, Judy, I think somebody wants to get in. These ones um, is, is kind of like the PC-104. And if you're not actually um if you're not if you're not actually um communicating with other stuff then the pc 104s you don't necessarily need them you can use them like i have but stacking these thing two together here is uh, no difference from just connecting with the x tips here so obviously using this one is great for for learning it's great to kind of like say we're building a cube set and this is how it works and uh, all the learning. But if you want to make a minimalistic uh, circuit, then this thing here does. And um, that is this frame here is 10 by 10 centimeter. So this is like the same size as a cube frame. And, uh, and the, um, the wall here is uh, two millimeter. So of course my kit here uh, fits perfectly inside the frame like that. You can see here, so I can hold it together like that. They, in the XK07, on the XK07 page that Judy put in here in the chat, there is a 3D print uh, files for this frame here. You can use the box.xnabox.cc to make your own if you want to have them like enclosed or something like that. But if you want to have them with the holes here, kind of like make them lightweight, uh, then the file are there. And the file is for both additive and subtractive processing what that means is that it have these rounded uh, corners here so if you want to mill them instead of 3d print them you don't have like uh, corners you can't get into and things like that so oh, everywhere it's kind of like designed so it's both additive which is uh, 3d printing or subtractive like milling you can do it both with the 3d files that you find on the website there um Cool. So now I have my flight station and uh, I think it's kind of like 100 uh, gram, 100 and some gram, can't remember how much it is, but that depends on, of course, uh, the batteries here. We sometimes use some dirty batteries and then away half of the rest, but then they don't last long. So let's start with the, the power solution here. Um, we suggest that if you fly with this, uh, this battery here and you want to put in a balloon or whatever, then use the lithium batteries. So not rechargeable lithium ion batteries, but lithium, just normal lithium batteries. They can uh, take the temperature down to minus 40. And minus 40 is one of those things which uh, minus 40 Celsius is minus 40 Fahrenheit. So it can go to minus 40. We have flown this on a balloon to um, uh, 36,000 feet, 12 kilometer. And we reach minus 55 degrees uh, Celsius. It's like minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. 
and we didn't have any problem. We had data all the way from all the sensors. So, you know, obviously minus 40 is this kind of like limit where they don't start, um, they don't promise you anything more. And we launched from, you know, South African ground. So we had like nice and hot weather on the ground and minus uh, 65 Fahrenheit when we reached the peak altitude where the balloon blew. Um, so uh, that's the kind of batteries here. Um, you can see here that it's only soldered in the one end, like here. And mine is a little bit loose here because I've been soldering a little point underneath here uh, for, for five volts. But if you want to tie it down, you can uh, put the batteries in and you could put a cable tie through some of the smaller holes here. Or there's also um, not very well aligned, uh, but there is actually a the hole in the back of the PCB here and holes in the, in the, in the, in the battery holder. And you might be able to actually um, align a screw to, to kind of like tie it down if you want to. Um, uh, we don't have a big problem. So normally when we fly this thing here, we take um, you know, a face line like this thing here. If you are actually gonna fly it on a balloon, it's not necessary that that's what you wanna use it for. And we just put it through the different holes and, and tear it underneath the balloon. And, um, and that's um, considerable lightweight compared to, for example, using too many cable ties. So that's a battery. Uh, the PPO4, the battery module you have, also gives, um, uh, there's a couple of sensors on board. So it tells you what the voltage level is on the battery directly. And it will also tell you what the current draw is on the 3.3 volts uh, that comes out of this thing here. So after the power has been able to 3.3 volt, it will tell you what the current draw is. And that's been uploaded with the standard software. So uh, we use that to kind of like uh, teach a student about, um, you know, power budget. So the big things is link budget, the radio and power budget, especially when you kind of like start uh, talking about um, 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 solar panels and charging and, you know, um, how much charging uh, capability there is. And when you start using the radio, normally more expensive compared to data, all that kind of stuff. Judy, you unmuted. Yes, Bjarke, when you hold things in front of the camera, please hold it a lot. Um, yeah, more still. still, because what it, it can make us a little bit nauseous with all of the <laughs> all of the motion. Please, motion sickness warning. Please. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> this is crazy. Okay, let's just squat outside first, and I'll make that security. Judy, will you mute uh, whoever it is? Um, uh, thanks. Um, I will hold it still. I'll try to hold it still. So that's the that's a power. Um, next on the line here, and I'm just taking it as it is here. I put the CS11. You can put this thing together almost in any random way, but I normally have the CS11 here at the bottom. And the reason for that is that if I want to put the SD card in and don't want to uh, 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 take it apart, the SD card here is in the back. Then I have the SD card here. I can actually slice it in um, like that. And I don't have to take it apart to put it in and out. So, so that's the reason why if, if you know, I want to um, you know, load the software in or take the data off the flight and things like that, if I have it in the lower corner here, then I don't have to uh, take it in and out. I have the battery here because the switch is sitting up here on, on that side. And by having the chips on top of it instead of below, then the power is act the power switch is actually protected um, instead of I have it up here, uh, and might you know by mistake turn it on and off. Uh, so that's a CS11. So that's your core. There's a little uh, reset button here, um, and uh, if you want to program that yourself, so there's a there's a file called update.bin. You put on an SD card and you load it into the SD card. And when you do that, it actually programmed the whole circuit. If you for some reason want to program it yourself, you need a programmer and you can use either the IPO2 or the IPO3, which is not in the kit, but it allows you to, to, um, to program that. And just so you know what that looks like, so IPO2 is a thing like that. It have two connectors because it actually communicate from here to USB over that little connector into this core here, which is using USB directly. 
This core is exactly the same core as the Arduino Zero. So if you're familiar with Arduino Zero, this is the same CPU that sits here, that sits here. So it's a AT, same D, 25, day 18 G, uh, for those who are in the know. Um, so nice little 32 bits, uh, 48 megahertz uh, um, processor that sits here. Uh, so from there, I go up to the SD33. So the SD33 is a, um, a sensor, a CO2 uh, and a VOC sensor. Uh, so TVOC, so total uh, volatile organic compound. So it measures that and then it estimates the CO2. I think it's very important to understand that. So it measures total volatile organic compounds. That means that kind of air where CO2 can be and that's typical when you have like a normal uh, indoor environment, then it will say, well, if there's so much of the total volatile organic compounds, that normally means there's so much CO2. But if you put that in your garage, so there's like another place in a, in a lab or anywhere where there's other kind of organic compounds, then it might say there's so much CO2 and maybe there's no CO2. So just be understand what it means by estimated CO2 level here. The total vol volatile organic compound is correct, measured in parts per billion, and the CO2 estimate is in part per million. Then we have the, uh, we call our weather chip here, SWR1. It measures temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure. Then I put the GPS here. This is the GPS antenna that is here. There's no external antenna. And the module sits here on the back. And I address that a little bit in the beginning. Um, so um, so this is a TPS. A couple of things to understand, it only, and I mentioned that when we started, only looks at TPS satellites. It doesn't look at GLONASS or Baidu or, or Galileo or any of the other satellite system. And for that reason, there's fewer satellites to see. So therefore, um, you typically have to have this outside in order for it to get uh, the, a fix. Um, so, um, and it doesn't have a battery backup. So that normally means that it will use, uh, this The fellow here will use the radio <coughs> to communicate to the ground station and the ground station will get the almanac over the internet using the Wi-Fi and it will then load the almanac up by the radio and put it back here on the SN01. Uh, so that's the way we kind of like have done that. And that's all in the, in the, in the software. So if you code your own stuff, you might kind of like be a little disappointed if it doesn't get data quick enough because it have to download the Almanac uh, from the satellite and it could take a little bit longer. Um, the radio I talked about with the ground station, there are no difference, exactly the same. <coughs> and then we have the light sensor. <coughs> it gives you ambient light and UV index. And then, <coughs> sorry, the last one we have is the SIO one. It's amazing. I have a black one here because it says uh, the one we have in the sunset, and I didn't have anyone else. And that is an IMU, so that's an accelerometer. It's a magnometer and it's a gyroscope. Um, it breaks down the vectors in X, Y, and Z, and those data is stored um, on the on the SD card here, and it also sends some of the data down, not all the data, but some of the data over. Uh, the radio. There's a list, of course, it can store much more on the SD card much more often. On the radio, which have a, a limited bandwidth, it's only sending down, I think we, we calculate one vector for acceleration, and then pitch and roll or something like that is also sent down from that. So let me see here a couple of questions. Um, I think we're okay. Uh, Daniel, Daniel Lee asked, the question, um, Daniel is from New Jersey. Um, okay. Uh, uh, from if he was, he's part of the, the Princeton team. Yes. Um, and uh, so we were. So can you integrate uh, uh, all your yeah. sensors? Yes. Absolutely. So, so what we have done is that we have uh, we have updated the code for a couple of sensors. So the one sensor, there's two sensors that we have. Um, uh, well, actually, the one is output and another is a sensor. The one is an analog sensor, SU-1. 
uh, O2, I think it's called. Um, yeah, SU02. Um, um, you know, uh, my desk is full of uh, of XFC, so I just try to find it. Here we go. No, I don't think it's SU02. I think it's SX, SX02 or something like that. I have a SX01, but it's an analog sensor. And what it is is that you simply, if you, for example, have a thermistor or or like a, 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 a another resist based uh, uh, sensor, then you can screw that into the terminal and it will simply just take the value, the voltage drop from 3.3 volts. It will just take that and report that uh, back to the over the ground station to the dashboard. So that's the one uh, uh, sensor we have added. Then we have another one with uh, not a sensor, but another output, and that's the OC01. And what the OC01 is that this is called the I2C expander. So what it does is it have three MOSFET outputs and it have one input. And uh, what we have is that we program that. So the idea is that you can, um, you can connect a, a buzzer on this screw terminal here or like an infrared LED. So I think we use port one and two on this thing here in the code. And what, what it does is that it figures out that when the accelerometer says there's no more movement, so that means when there's a landed on the ground, then this one here turns on the buzzer, you know, like for, 10, for a second, every 10 seconds. So it's like goes on and stop for, uh, for 10 seconds and then starts again. And the idea is that when this is landed somewhere, but you can't see it, then you can hear the buzzer. So we kind of like added that. And we also use the second channel because you can use an infrared or a normal LED. So, it, you know, maybe you have a bright LED, so it will light up that LED. If it's an infrared or something like that, you can use a drone to fly over and you can see it in daylight, that kind of stuff. So that's the other one that we included. Um, if, any, if any of you want to actually start working on the software, then we're very happy to, uh, give you access to the software that we wrote to this thing here, and then you can start, uh, you know, um, updating it uh, with more sensors and things like that. From time to time, we add sensors to it, but um, that's kind of like what I believe we have added now. Uh, yeah, but but uh, adding more sensor is, is uh, not the biggest problem. So Daniel, if you want to uh, play with that, then just um, let me know and then I will, uh, I will let you in. We, the guys from Stanford, they are actually, um, they, they've gone in and worked, especially on the, on the SI01, the one that they, another breakdown of the data on SI01. So they have been in and, 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 you know, um, updated the software a bit and things like that. So we happy to plow it out there, open source, and then, you know, you can do, uh, PRs and all that kind of stuff. If, um, if there's some updates, uh, more than happy to do that, but. We kind of like just want to make sure that those we get on board here is um, also able to to kind of like um, uh, add the right thing. Um, you can, of course, I mean, we have libraries uh, to almost all our sensors. Uh, I can't remember and imagine anywhere you don't have to. So if you want to write your own code, it's straightforward. Um, um, obviously, we've done a lot to, to write the code for this thing here. But if you want to write your own code, uh, for any reason, then uh, there's libraries to the for the radios and for every chip here, plus obviously also for for a lot of the other chips that uh, we have. Okay, so that's um, there's a new method here. Yes, please. Is that Git repo? Yeah, there is. Um, uh, there's no test bench or any. I mean, I haven't had the chance to put a, you know a code review or any of that kind of stuff in. Um, so hey. Uh, Matt, I will be very happy if you do a test bench also. So, so there is a Git repo, but right now it's private. But uh, as I said, you know, I will uh, if if people here is interested, I will make it public, and I will be happy that that people um, get a chance to to uh, jump on here. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, Judy, just put my email in here, and then let people contact me if uh, if there is anything. Um, yeah, I, I know I have an accent, so I don't know, Jay, if I have my own language here. Um, but uh, what we use to program all this thing here is actually Arduino. So it's straightforward Arduino code. There's no hocus pocus. Uh, the CS11, and I'm just saying it because uh, the CS11 here that can also be programmed in uh, in um, uh, in Circuit Python. 
uh, so we have CircuitPython. If you go into circuitpython.org, I think it's called, then you can find the CS11 here and there's a file you can drag and drop to, to that. You need like uh, obviously a programmer for it, so you can program that. You can also program it in make code. Make code is like a similar to, um, uh, to Scratch, you know, MIT Scratch, but make code is made by Microsoft. And if you go to maker.makecode.org, you can find the CS11 here also. You still need this thing here, sorry about that, but then you can actually program. We have libraries for, I believe, uh, almost everything there also, so you can actually uh, program in, in maker code for that also. Uh, the sample code for the kit is written in Arduino, that's correct. Um, so so uh, nothing special. Um, I use Arduino. I know you can, uh, you know, uh, program in Arduino and use uh, Microsoft VC, uh, VS Code or whatever, but uh, I, I just use the Arduino IDE. Um, <clears throat> actually, I don't. I have a programmer who does it, so, but I know he's using um, uh, IT, uh, Arduino's IDE. Um, yes, Judy, what more can I say? Is everybody uh, on board here? Anybody have any problems using it? Anything you want to hear more about? Um, what I want to do is just want to say that um, there is, um, um, if you go to YouTube, I'm just uh, um, putting that in here, YouTube dot com slash x in a box there is a i think it's called x tips daily playlist uh so in the beginning of the lockdown um uh sorry i just have to say here um send to everybody um so there's a playlist called x tips daily and uh, if you find that in youtube.com slash x in a box you will see I have like half an hour programs where I've gone through programming um, uh, and, and working with them. There's also like lessons I've done in, in, uh, in you know, with, with, with graphs and things like that in, in the power budget and in link budget for the radios and, you know, the terms I'm using, like the Fresnel zone and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's in, in some of these uh, things here. If you want to, uh, try out the X tips. For example, it's basically you have a you can program the CW one here, and you can of course use these ones. You can take this and mix it as you want to. There's no like you, you can use that. So for example, uh, with the CW one, the IPO one, and uh, and uh, OTO one plus uh, the SW one here and the SL one, these together creates a kit that's called the XK one, and then you can run that kit standalone um, also. And there's software in the X on the box uploader to that, uh, that allows you to, to upload that software and you connect it and then you have like a, a little standalone module. But if you want to kind of like play around with it, otherwise, if you go to hexta, dot, I think it's dot com slash X in a box, then uh, we have a lot of uh, projects there. And then also uh, if you go to GitHub, um uh, dot com slash x in a box we have all our libraries there if you go to github uh, dot com slash x in a box samples i think it's called then um we have a lot of samples there that uh, you can play around with so that's um some of the places where you can find uh, more information about uh, how, how to to use this thing here and, and maybe very important is also that, for example, if you want to know what is the SW1 here, if you go to, uh, if you say X in a box, uh, X, X in a box dot uh, CC slash, um, let's say SW1 as an example. So I'm just putting in there the same that if you take, and here I have, uh, let me just find something that's interesting. Um, here I have an IMO one. So this is a micro bit uh, bridge. So this is micro bit. So we have a bridge for that. And if you want to know more about it, you can scan the QR code here, or you can see there's a, a link here where it says X in a box that CC slash IMO one. 
and you just put that in and it comes up and say page not found and then it goes to the page anyhow. I don't know why. But you go to that page. If you do that with SW1 as an example, I put in a code. Then in the headline, it will say in a bracket BME280. So this is because this chip that sits here is a BME280. Uh, so if you then, for example, say, well, uh, um, can I use another Arduino library with the BME280? Yes, you can. You can use Adafruit or SparkFonts or anybody else's library for the BME280. You don't have to use ours. The reason why we call it SW1 is that, for example, the SL1, we used to use some, some chips here for our light sensor, and then they were end of life. So we have to change it to something else, and we didn't want to go out and disappoint people with, you know, we didn't have the kit or whatever it is. So we made a new SL1, so there's a new version, and we just make sure our software supports both the old and the new SL1. The same actually happened with the ST33. This is a, it used to be a CCS811, but that's end of life. So now it's a, not a sensor. I can't remember the, what sensor it is now, but it's a new sensor also on the SD33. And that happens. Uh, our software, we just update the software so it works on the old or the new one. There's no difference. It comes out with uh, the same values. It's just um, some of them decide to. Um, I XO two chips by any chance if we choose to use I square C. So uh, I square uh, um, I XO two uh, is not necessarily something you want to use. You want to use I XO one. I know it says uh, I square C uh, on. Um, so we have these in uh, these bridges here, and the one that's called um, I XO two have a converter chip on it. And that allows to take um, something that is uh, uh, that is SPI and convert that to I square C. So that is what the IXO2 is. It's a SPI to I square C converter. I'm thinking here if I'm right. Uh, I think it's the same converter that sits on the radio. So the radio here, this Let radio. Me, I'll look it up for you. Thanks. The radio here is uh, is running SPI, a SPI, depending on uh, how you pronounce it. But it runs a, a, a bus that we don't run normally. So what we have here is that we have a converter that converts from SPI to I square C so it can talk with the rest of the bus. Uh, so, so the IXO2 is a chip similar to this one here that sits on a board similar to that that convert from SPI to, uh, uh, to I square C. Um, this one here, which I think is, uh, uh, Daniel, you, you might uh, want to use instead. If you, for example, say, let's, you know, my, uh, my um, lab is full of, of, uh, of other kits. So I'm just kind of trying to see if I can find anything. Um, yeah, here we go. So, so for example, here I have a um, uh, here I have a little um, little breakout board for another uh, BME two hundred and eighty. You can see it says uh, BME two hundred and eighty. You probably can't see it. Just trust me. It says BME two hundred and eighty, and then down here is like uh, is like it says SCL and SDA and uh, VNC, VCC and all that kind of stuff. If you want to integrate this fellow here. With your board or let's say for example i have a tsl uh, 2561 this is a lock sensor and that's from adafruit okay so if i want to use any of these you know you plug it into a breadboard and then you start connecting so this is a standard x chips to breadboard converter chip if i can call it like a bridge and then you actually start just wiring from there to there so this hopefully runs 3.3 volts. So you just take 3.3 from here to here, ground from here to here, SCL from here to here, and SDA from here to here. And then this is now interfaced. And of course, if you want to use both, uh, then you just um, you know double up. Because it's I square C, there's no problem. You can just take the same four wires from here to here. And then you have that. You can also take like sensors that's completely impossible, like for example, 
this is uh, this is also Sonic Sensor. So that uses like a some ridiculous protocol. I don't know which one it is, but you can take that and you can use the RX and TX up here. Uh, so the RX and TX is like some pins uh, uh, on 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 the uh, on the CW1. They are also available on the CS11. And then you can just use the RX and TX pin to connect to this one here and just use them as a TPIO. So that's the way that you um, you can uh, uh, connect that. So the RX01 here, there's nothing on it. And these pins all have to be, I mean, you get them, they come with the, with the, uh, with the board, but uh, that comes in like a strip like that. But you have to solder them in yourself because some people, they want to not have pins, they want to have headers and things like that. So, um, but if you're going to use a breadboard, you're probably going to uh, get your solder iron out anyhow. So this is uh, to interface with the rest of the stuff. Daniel, did that uh, answer your question? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'll just shoot in here through verbally. Um, so that answers the question, I think, for the physical aspect, but more so in terms of the actual data coming back. And I think Judy is trying to get you to talk about this a little bit as well. But in terms of the data that's coming back, how would we parse that? Would that come through as just the address, like the raw addressing? Or is there a way that we can actually have the dashboard read out that data? So say, for example, it's a secondary IMU unit, right? Is there a way that we can parse that data through the software? Or is that something that you would have to do on your side? Like, how would that work? OK, so I mean, the data the data that uh, comes uh, via the ground station here, that comes using the MQTT server, right. uh, which I think are documented in uh, on the Xcode 7 page. And there you can go in and you can, I mean, so for for you for some of you guys that maybe don't know, MQTT is like a message queuing server. So th so the way it works is that our data is coming down and it's then being loaded to a message queuing server. And message queuing like MQTT, the way it works is that you have a publisher or maybe more than one, but every one who have a kit like that is a publisher, and they publish the data. And then you can subscribe to it like a newspaper. And little like a newspaper you can. Just because it published once, you can still subscribe to a number of different from a number of different places. As soon as a new newspaper comes out, in this case, a new record comes down, the old one is deleted. So it's just a queuing server. So if you're not listening to it all the time, you're going to lose the data. We have a dashboard, which is data.xnabox.cc. That dashboard uh, is then that uh, automatic takes the data from the from the MQTT server. But if you want to have your own dashboard, let's say you want to do something in Azure or AWS or um, um, uh, any of the other many uh, uh, services out there, you can then subscribe from that and get it into your own, uh, own system. So that's half uh, the answer, uh, Daniel. And, I, and, and Judy, uh, I can't remember on the on the page there, how much it talks about the dashboard and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, if we have to cover that a little more, maybe you want to uh, just uh, uh, cover that aspect, especially logging in and things like that. With regards to that, if you put in, let's say, a secondary SIO one. So if you say, for example, you have a, sorry, not a SIO one, but let's say, for example, one of these uh, sensors we talked about here was actually uh, uh, IMUs, and you have like a BNO. Uh, 055 or something like that, and you want to get the data in from that. Then um, uh, uh, the code is not supporting that, obviously, uh, because um, even though we have it, I think we call it SI20, we're not selling the chip, but we have done the, the BNO uh, 055. So we have, a, we have a chip like that, but still in, in prototyping. But if, you, but if you want to use another uh, I am you and put the data through this thing here. You have to update the code, but you can do that and you can simply just create uh, a, a, a new uh, a paragraph insight. So if I go uh, to, um, um, I, I wonder if there's any uh, stuff that come, I can actually show it just uh, the general one. So let me just share my screen here when yeah, my input is. I, I think one of the issues that we started running into is that we weren't exactly sure how to change a bin file um, because I know that what gets uploaded to the CS11 is a bin file. So, yeah, so, so, so that's that's correct. That's just an another Arduino file. Right. You have to, uh, you have to uh, 
uh, update. Uh, but let me just um, show uh, the first part here. Let me just share my screen. Um, share in QT box here. So um, for the weather station, so this is uh, not the XK07, but, but the weather station. I just know that data comes in here. So MQTT box is a, is a, a just like a browser that can browse MQTT data. You can see here, it comes in as a, a JSON file. So here's a JSON file here that coming in with the data. And if I take this, um, I, I'm just going to stop here. Um, So if I take this data here, like that, and let me just uh, stop sharing for a second. So, Bianca, I think you muted yourself. Can everybody else hear Bjorka or is it just me? I've lost him. I think we might have lost him. Okay, I'm going to go knock on his door. Great. Um, yeah, he uh, he disconnected by mistake. So he's he's on his way back. Ah, he's in the waiting room. Should I admit him? Ah, oh, let me admit him. Okay. Mr. Bjork, are you back? I'm back. I got a little bit too excited here. And uh, by mistake, I, uh, I stopped <laughs> at the Zoom <laughs> meeting and I went for lunch. Anyhow, um, if I go back to uh, my browser here, and uh, now I want to uh, see if I can actually share that screen instead. Um, hang on a second. Here we go. Share. Okay, so this is a, this is a JSON. So I use this JSONLint.com just to kind of like format it. So the way it comes from our kit that's called XK1, it's the same with XK7, but I don't have the data here. But you can see here I have something I call ground station then SW1, and then you can see the data here. So this is how it looks like if you subscribe on the MQTT. So it looks like it. And here's the SL1 data, and then there's a CW1 data. We have some input data here, and then there's a timestamp. If you, for example, say, I want to go in and modify the code and have my own sensor in here, you can put in you know, your own one here, call it Daniel's IMU or whatever, and then you can put the record in here. You know, that's, and then you can use the same kind of like system to get it through. Whenever you put in here, if I go to the dashboard, so the dashboard is a data.xinabox.cc, whatever there is in the JSON file, the dashboard will automatically pick up. So data, x in a box. Bianca, I would maybe, um, I think you can take everybody to the XK07 index because we actually yeah. have a, we have a template dashboard on that one. Yeah, so I don't know if you have any data, Julie, that's my concern. I just want to show here that the data I just had here, if I look in this discover, you can see here is the, 
CW1, the SW1, the timestamp, and things like that. So the, your data, if it comes in via the MQTT server, and it's called Daniel's IMU, it will come in like that. Uh, let's go to, it will come in over this one here called XK07. So that's the index where it will come in. There's nothing in the last 15 minutes. I don't know if there's a- go, Yeah, any, look back some years. I'll take three months here is something, okay? So if I take this data here um, and zoom in on that, and zoom in on this thing here. So this is uh, 19 February. So this is, uh, um, I'm just zooming into to where we have data. So you can see here, that's uh, 19 February, which is like four days ago, from 4.35 to uh, 6.40 here. And the data that comes in here is then looked like, actually, it, it comes in in two records. So if I add the, um, the unit name here, and then I'm gonna go in and add the logs. Um, Okay, so this one here, uh, um, temperature. Okay, anyhow, if I go in and click on any of these uh, records here and go into the JSON, you can see here that I have SL1, CW1, SI1, ILO3. So the data is coming in here. This one is not flying, so there's no GPS data coming in on this record here. If there was GPS record, it would come in two different records. So, but I could see that everything came in every record. That means it's only the data record comes in uh, as it is uh, here. So, so, so if you, Daniel, do your own one, you can simply just go in and create another sensor here uh, with your own stuff when you get access to the code. I hope that uh, answered the question, Daniel. Uh, yeah, that definitely answers the question. So do you know about when we should be able to have access to that code then or how we would I, uh, I, I can I can arrange it for you tomorrow. So, so that's cool. Uh, do me a favor. Just send me with an email your GitHub um, your GitHub handle because okay. the way it works is that it's the GitHub handle that gets the that get the access. Yeah, and sure. If you if you're more than one who want access, like other guys in your team, then just uh, email me the the handles for these other guys. Yep. And the same goes for the rest of you. If you want to get access to the code behind it and want to start programming things like that, let me just have the handle. So in the beginning, I just want to keep a little bit uh, hand over how we, we do this. And, and then everybody can see who is uh, participating in, in the code development here. Um, good. Uh, Judy? Uh, there's, there's, uh, I'm not seeing any more questions, Bjarke. So what I was no? thinking is maybe we should just... I mean, we could wrap up um, and uh, yeah, maybe a call for if there are any more questions. Um, I mean, first of all, I think, um, uh, do me a favor, uh, just uh, send, um, you know, spam dude an email about uh, whether you want to have this thing happening again or not again, or I figure out if I'm, I'm, I'm delivering uh, what you guys are expecting. Um, we're very happy about you know doing this thing here, and maybe some of you say this is the middle of the night, or it's too early, or too late, or whatever, and 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 you want to have another session running another time. Then then let's uh, do that. I'm also very happy to kind of like say with Daniel, and we have a couple of guys Stanford, and maybe some of the other guy who want to to kind of like do uh, dig into the programming and understand the programming. I could do a, a special session for that if you want to actually, um, you know, start doing uh, your own sensors in the program and that kind of stuff. I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to run a session like that. So I can see I have Ma Matt and Daniel here to, uh, um, it's an APA doc that will help. No, we're not that sophisticated yet. <laughs> that would be great, but um, a coding workshop will definitely be, um, and Jeff, I will definitely do that. So, so let me maybe have that, and then you know, if if you guys like and things like that, we can open source it, and we can then use that to actually start doing a, a code um, code coverage and 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 test bands and all that kind of stuff, and uh, and make sure that uh, um, that we have that. We just to kind of like 
uh, you know, put it on the same together what, what, what we kind of like cover. We, we kind of like the hardware supply of this thing is that we want to do the libraries and make sure you can use it and all that. The, the reason why we do the software here for the XK7, XK90, and, and we have this other kit that's called XK01, that's kind of like so, so, well, so people can have an out of the box experience. And of course, we have developed that. We actually in the second generation of the software for, for both of them. Um, so, so the new one here, we had a, a intern who started it last year, and we had a programmer who's been working on it for the last year to, to kind of like get it up to 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 that. But it's the software we have and the libraries we have is all MIT open source. Um, it's not like opened up for for this specific, but all our libraries are all MIT open source. And um, and we we kind of like want to make sure that the software is, uh, you know, everybody can have access to it. It's just uh, as you know, the libraries is a little bit easier to do because they just work and they're there. When we start doing software like this thing here, you know, we start getting questions about API and code coverage and uh, and um, uh, and you know a, 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 a test bench and things like that. And then suddenly, oh, are we in too deep here? And, and that's just the reason why it's then not happening. So we will open if uh, we can and without uh, like suddenly, you know, it's a hectic workload um, uh, on our side. So that's the reason why we just, I'm, I'm just careful about uh, how I promise this thing here, but but I really will enjoy if some of you guys want to uh, uh, join in. Uh, the other thing is like, for example, if, uh, you know, um, we don't attempt to do you know, uh, satellite control software. Uh, you know, NASA have this CSF that runs on the on a Raspberry Pi. So, uh, you know, that could be great. It could be super great that maybe we took the CSF and kind of like updated so it used the different sensors here. So, if people want to use the CSF, there was kind of like an an instruction or manual how to do that. You know, things like that would be great. So we can start using. Some of the software that's out there that that uh, you know people have put a lot of effort in to use. Um, we're super happy that we can deliver, you know, uh, low cost tips here that can uh, be used for for training everywhere. And you know, when you have a ground stage and things like that, you have everything to start uh, building your satellite at home without a need for a lab. And we want to keep that software is the big thing. So so we want to open that up for everyone. Uh, but Judy, if you take down Daniel, Jeff, Matt here, which I think is uh, the, the ones here who have um, who, who have um, kind of like wanted to to be part of a, 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 um, a, code, a coding workshop, then I will set one up, and then maybe we get uh, Catherine and Martin and and Marcus from Stanford. Um, you know, maybe they want to be part of that, and then we, yeah, and maybe we, we do something like that. Uh, Mike from Princeton, it's and Mike from Princeton might uh, want to join also. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Any other questions? Um, yeah. Um, That's. I don't think so. Um, oh, yo, we got one here. Uh, um yeah, no Matt, you can you, yeah whatever you want to send Matt, it's fine i don't mind you can uh whatever that suits you uh i'm not uh it doesn't have to be the school email or anything so uh, that's great judy will you take that down yeah great good well thank you everyone um and i'm going to what uh what we'll do is we will um, we'll have the link to the video a, a little bit later. It'll still need to render. And then, um, yeah, if you would like the link, uh, just please pop me an email and uh, that'll be perfect. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Bianca. That was really great. And um, uh, we'll see you all next time. Uh, you'll be getting more invitations from us uh, from, from time to time. So thank you all for joining us and uh, we'll see you around. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much.